how popular mindfulness is today. But it's important to have a shared understanding of mindfulness. Yeah. But it's especially important to be able to evaluate what are the effects of mindfulness through long-term practice and short-term practice. And part of what I'll say today is how would psychologists and how do psychologists go about evaluating uh, the outcomes of mindfulness practice. But I thought I'd just give you a little bit of background because this is my journey into mindfulness and into my current role at the Nantian Institute. I, I like to say I came from a large family. I was one of 11 children. Oh, and, wow. And, and, and we were poor. But that was a really good start in life because you take nothing for granted. You know, no one's going to give you anything. You have to earn what you're going to get. So I was happy there. Good Christian values, strong emphasis on education. I was the first in my family to go to university. And as a result, I, I had a, a really, really good professional life. All my life's been spent in universities. I started as a lecturer at the University of Tasmanian Psychology a long time ago. Went to the University of Wollongong as a professor. Then I've moved up a few steps and finished up at the University of Southern Queensland as the Vice Chancellor, which was a, a very interesting role, a terrific role. But I was telling you all of that because then I ran into a problem. It was, a, a, in a sense, a small problem. You probably all had these in the workplace. There was a personal difficulty at work which applied a stress to me or a pressure that I'd never had before. The job was a terrific job and I, was, I liked the job, everything I liked, but I had one personal difficulty. But it's, if it's the wrong person you have a personal difficulty with, mm -hmm. it goes across your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so I needed some new coping skills. And so I'd read, I'd heard about meditation. So I, I downloaded a meditation, not the apps like they have now, it was a bit before apps, but it was quite easy to find stuff on the web to help with meditation. Then I started to read meditation and, and do my own mindfulness practice. And I did find quite quickly it was a good coping uh, mechanism. It helped to manage the stress. And I think it was really important that, I'm not sure that many people I worked with would have known that I felt the stress that was there because of this useful coping skill. But I want to put, and that's how I got to Nantia. When I retired, I wanted to keep doing something that was intellectually stimulating. And a good friend of mine that I'd worked with at the University of Wollongong told me about Nantian Institute running accredited courses, running master's degrees and so on. So I thought I'll go along and study there. And, and I've done that. And I'm now, I'm now working there. That's what happens if you study at Nantian. You get very good jobs. <laughs> and when I finished my graduate certificate, I became the president. <laughs> So that's one good reason to study at Nantian. But I put up here the, my learnings at Nantian about some of the origins of mindfulness. But I'm aware that there are quite different traditions in Buddhism. And for those who don't know, the Sutra or Sutras, they're teachings of the Buddha, and there's a very, very large collection of those. And it's my understanding that in Chinese Buddhism, there are different Sutras that form the basis of a mindfulness practice is that, but the Satipatthana Sutra or Sutra is an important sermon, you call it in, in Christian terms, to a gathering of monks by the Buddha as the path to realization or the path to liberation or the path to enlightenment. So, in that, he gave very, very specific instructions to guide mindfulness med meditation. And in this meditation, you could focus on a number of areas. So meditation, in simple to... I might just skip through to give you a definition, then come back. So, the, the most common definition of mindfulness in Western society, in research in Western society, is this simple one here. It's paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. Uh, this is another one that's used currently now. It's a direct, clear, unreflected, non-judgmental awareness or observation of what is actually happening. Uh, that is the mental and physical processes from moment to moment. When it says what is actually happening, uh, 
there's an interesting thing that I've learned through my study of Buddhism. If you're experiencing something, you can separate it into what's the immediate experience. So if you have a sore hip, there are a number of things that go with a sore hip. There's an immediate sensation, there are sensations in my hip. There are then interpretations of what that means. One interpretation is, oh my hip is really sore. It's so sore, tomorrow I won't be able to walk. The day after that I'll have to go to the doctor. Then I'll have to have a hip replacement. So there's the immediate sen I'm exaggerating that a little bit. <laughs> but there's the immediate sensation. Then there are the interpretations you can place on. And most of the pain and issues of that sort come from the interpretations, not from the immediate uh, perception or awareness. And so I think uh, when this says uh, of what is actually happening, what's happening in my hip, uh, some neural, some nerves firing, uh, my brain interprets those as pain, then other bits of my brain keep adding all the other issues onto it and then leading to pain. So in mindfulness, you're really trying to avoid all those other interpretations. In mindfulness, you're simply focusing on something. And the most common form in, in, that I've been exposed to is you focus on the breath. Breathing in, breathing out, nose or stomach. So it's just focusing on something simple which must have quite a relaxing effect on the rest of the brain and the body. So if I go back up here now. In meditation, and, and in this initial teaching by the Buddha, you can focus on the body, which includes the breath, or you can focus on feelings, how do you feel? But once again, trying not to interpret your feelings. You don't want to say, oh, I feel awful. And I feel awful because I really dislike that person because that person did a mean thing to me. That's, you don't want to go there. But it's just focusing on what are the, what are the feelings without interpreting, just observing. Uh, but the, the, the teaching of the Satipatthana Sutta is embedded very much in the broader context of the Four Noble Truths in, in Buddhism. You, most of you know those better than me, I imagine. I know them so well I can't remember them. <laughs> no, there is suffering. There is... What's, causes of oh, the causes of suffering, greed, uh, hatred and delusion. There's a pathway out of suffering and there's enlightenment. So that, they're basic tenets of, of Buddhism. Is that pretty well across all forms of Buddhism? And I'm going back to this sutra, the... The Buddha said, there is only one way, much talking to a group of monks, for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the destruction of pain and grief, for reaching a right path, for the attainment of nirvana or nirvana, namely the four functions of mindfulness, which are these up here. Uh, so, for, for the Buddha and his teaching, uh, mindfulness was an important part of the of the Eightfold Noble Path, which I'll come to. But there are quite different historical traditions or sutras. So I'll put a question there. What is the main sutra that you that underpins your understanding of the importance of meditation? The heart sutra? The heart sutra, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people knew that, they were just shy. There's an important question in, within Buddhism, but within contemporary psychology, which is, how do you teach mindfulness? Do you just teach it as a skill, as a personal development skill, or do you teach it in a Buddhist context? So I'll come back to that shortly. So in the way that it was taught, as I understand it, in the Sadhupatthana Sutra, it's not a separate skill. It's very much part of the Eightfold Noble Path. And, and the Eightfold Noble Path has eight steps. And I like the way, this way of classifying into wisdom, into virtue, into concentration, as the three categories. And in the concentration, you'll see there's right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Uh, and the, the empirical question here is, is it more effective to practice mindfulness within this Buddhist context 
because uh, we embedded in here a whole lot of, do you can rephrase these as Buddhist ethics and Buddhist values? Is it more effective to practice mindfulness while practicing these other good values? Or can you just take mindfulness as a skill that you can learn like you, you can learn any skill? It's an interesting question. There's not a lot of empirical evidence yet that, that tells you which way to go. If you talk to the venerables, I'm certain they would say, uh, learning mindfulness in the absence of good ethics and in the absence of living uh, to, according to, with good ethics, it won't be as effective. So that's quite an important question. So the Buddhism came to the West in a range of ways. One path was this way, uh, where a range of Westerners studied in Asia. There are really at least two paths, simplifying. This is one path, uh, and this is where a lot of the simple meditation comes from, uh, which is a lot of Westerners in the 70s and 80s studied in Asia, especially in Burma and uh, Sri Lanka. And many of these went back to America and started writing and promoting Buddhism in a big way. So these are some of the authors that I read early on. Do many of you have read any of these authors? Yeah. yeah. And John, Ka oh, they're all pretty well known. Sharon Salzberg really focuses on loving kindness. She's written a lot on loving kindness. Uh, they all do a bit of everything. Jack Cornfield and Sharon Goldstein, they set up a big uh, insight meditation center in somewhere in America. John kabat is probably, he may be the best known uh, because he developed something I'll come to shortly or here. He developed a mindfulness-based stress reduction program when he was at the Massachusetts Hospital and that is used very, very widely in research studies trying to evaluate the effects of mindfulness training. There's another route which went to the West, and probably Tibetan Buddhism went to America in a very big way. Uh, and Zen Buddhism, you hear a lot about that. Uh, and she was look, obviously looking for inner peace in some other way. But I don't know if there's a consistent uh, pattern there. Any other comments at this stage? Not, not compulsory. I was just thinking that, you know, I think any, any religion, and I'm not just specifically Buddhism, that goes to another culture, does get enculturated anyway. You know, it takes on the flavour of the local culture. And, you know, even Buddhism, when it went into China, you know, did incorporate a bit of Taoism, a bit of Confucianism, and things like that. So it's, it's normal, I suppose, when, when something does travel to another culture yeah. that many aspects are taken on. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. And from my studies at Nantian Institute, looking at the spread of Buddhism across, a whole, across the world, that's the dominant characteristic, that Buddhism has been very effective at adapting to the local socio-political climate and so on. And so you do, do then get different manifestations of, of the practices and so on, while retaining much of the same uh, central views and beliefs and values and so on. So I, I touched on this earlier, but uh, if you're going to do research on mindfulness, you need a way of defining it, then you need a way of measuring it. So I mentioned before that this second uh, issue here is the definition by John Kabat-Zinn of the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. But it's interesting, uh, mindfulness is used to refer to a state. So if you're in an agitated state, that's the state you're in. You can be in a calm state. But we talk about traits as well. What's your ongoing trait? Are you, in an ongoing way, agitated or are you in an ongoing way relaxed? So there's a difference between state and trait. And to some extent, uh, you need to be able to measure both of those things. I'm just looking around for sort of nodding heads. <laughs> Not nodding off to sleep heads. <laughs> So how would you measure mindfulness in research? Everything in the, in, in the world of research is quite controversial. Uh, this is using a questionnaire. If you talk to some purists, they say, well, you can't really measure experience through a questionnaire. As a, a psychologist, we do a lot through questionnaires. And they're, they're not bad approximations. So the five-factor mindfulness questionnaire tries to measure five aspects of your interior being when you're uh, 
being mindful. One is observing, and it measures how much you do or don't do this. Uh, so there'd be a whole lot of questions like this, and you just fill out, yes, I do this, or no, I don't do that. There are 39 questions in total. Uh, describing, are you good at describing your feelings? Uh, do you act with awareness? Uh, do you judge your inner experience? Uh, you meet people who just do this all the time. <laughs> I may be one of them. Uh, who, who, who create angst for themselves in quite a big way because they're really judgmental of their own feelings. Uh, and if you, as you become increasingly mindful, you become less judgmental of your feelings. You simply observe your feelings rather than judging them. And it's a much healthier state. And also, you don't react as much to your inner feelings. Um, and there's a concept that I'll come to later, equanimity, where you, you can experience something, you can react immediately, impulsively, and normally, normally negatively, or you can just hold back, be a bit more economist, is apparently the word for it, from equanimity. Behave with more equanimity, and, and you don't re react as impulsively. You look a bit puzzled. No? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, for helping me out. <laughs> so, so it, seems, it seems like the person who actually fill in the, or answer the question, we have to be quite mindful because if, if they're actually not aware of how they feel or how they observe, how are they going to answer those questions? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, this is quite a good questionnaire. We measure things called reliability and validity. So it's really quite reliable. But I want to go to your question specifically. There's, there's when you measure this, you can get one overall score for mine, or you can get five separate scores. And one of the scales is especially unreliable in mind. It seems to be, and it's, it's, the, uh, it's the observing one. People are really quite consistent in how they reply on all of these. And I, I, I know what you said about, you have to be somewhat mindful to be able to answer them. Well, it seems that people are very consistent, and you may say, well, no, they don't have to be mindful because if they're not mindful, they'll get a really low score. Uh, but there's one measure that's quite variable, and I think it's because people can interpret the question in quite different ways. You know, that's, that's the most common way. So if you want to know, does mindfulness influence people? You can do other things as well. You can, uh, you can just ask them, does mindfulness help you? And that's quite useful. But that's notoriously unreliable. Uh, so I'll, come, I'll come back to that. So in, in the Western world over the last 20 or 30 years, the most common tool, if you like, for measuring whether mindfulness helps people or not is that John Kabat-Zinn that I mentioned earlier, this mindfulness-based stress reduction program that he developed. Uh, this is run, it seems to me, it's run in many, many countries in the world nowadays. You can do these in Sydney. There's a company here that runs them. It's an eight-week course. Uh, they introduce you to body scan uh, meditation, which is, uh, that was the third uh, area of, of mindfulness that I put up before, where you just slowly work through your body, just, just focusing on your body all the way through, without interpreting, uh, without judging, just focus. Or you can do breathing, introduce you to yoga, so there are weekly classes, there are lectures, there's one day retreat, and they do expect people to have to practice at home 45 minutes a day. Um, Excuse me, you know the, the previous slices, um, can I have a, a, a copy of that, the, you know, the measurements of my... Yeah, place? yeah, I'll, I'll, you can have a copy of the whole thing. Okay. You have can. you got the 48, how, how many did you say? that we can, that we, you know, like those checklists. The 39 questions. 39 questions. I can Everybody give you the reference for that. I don't have them all on the slide. Excellent, that would be great. I'll tell you how to get there. Thank yeah. you. Fantastic. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, nowadays I supervise honor students at the University of Wollongong doing research on the effects of mindfulness on mm. psychological outcomes. 
And some years, the students choose, and one of the professors there, they'd gone along to do the mindfulness-based stress reduction course. So I didn't go, but I'd talk to them about it, and I'd say, well, how are you going with the 45 minutes daily practice? And all of them said, oh, we don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but they just said, we're too busy. <laughs> but if you talk to people who have been practicing mindfulness a lot, a lot of people, you may have your own comments here, would say, my 45 minutes a day mindfulness practice helps me to be more productive. It adds to my day, it doesn't subtract from my day. Mm -hmm. Does anyone here share that experience? Or? That's interesting. Because if, you, if you've got a really busy schedule, it's, it's pretty hard to put that time aside, you think. And it's really hard to be mindful <laughs> when you're sitting there thinking about all the things you could be doing, your mind would be full. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Not mindful. Mind, well, can I say so? I just find it so easy to be mindful if you're just spending a bit of time a day doing something you enjoy, whatever it is. Mm. It's, it's so easy to focus on that. And, it's like you're saying, if you work so much, you don't have time to do anything you enjoy in life. You're better off sort of taking a step back to do something you enjoy for an hour or so, and you're more productive than those other however many hours in a day you've got. It works much better. I just came across an incredibly good example of that. I used to work in Toowoomba, and I'll just back up there. In Toowoomba there's a thing called a flexi school. It only has 75 students. But it's a school for kids who have been expelled from every other school. They are the naughtiest kids in Toowoomba. Uh, you know, a lot of them have been on, on drugs. They're, they're really naughty kids. But the school does wonderful things with them, or they do wonderful things with the school. And the guy who was running it, he, I was thinking about mindfulness, he said, oh, we'll give this a go. They don't have formal meditation or focusing on the breath or whatever, but they take these really naughty kids down to a a university field station and they sit by a creek and they have to sit for an hour just being quiet listening to nature that's all they're doing they're not practicing any formal form of meditation and the people told me that it's quite dramatic that all these young kids who have real problems as a rule staying focused sitting still no one misses Thursday when they have that excursion they just go and they sit and some of them say, they say, they say, you know, our lives are fairly chaotic, our heads are just full of junk. Mm -hmm. And this just empties our heads. It was quite a dramatic report. Uh, they didn't measure it by the five factor mindfulness question, did they? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still certain it was quite valid, uh, quite valid outcomes. Bruce, so what do you mean, how do you, how do you do these studies in the contemporary world? Well, the standard, the most common study is a training study where you measure people's behaviour on a range of issues to start with. So you might measure how mindful they are, but you might then measure depression, anxiety, panic, stress, a whole range of things. So you choose what you're going to start measuring. Then you teach them mindfulness over a number of weeks. Then you measure them again. And so you look at What's the change from the pre-test score through the training to the post-test? So how much change was there on depression, on anxiety, on a whole range of things? But you then have to say, well, how would you know the change has occurred because of your intervention, because you gave them mindfulness? How do you know it just didn't happen? How do you know it just didn't happen, other things happened? Well, what you normally do, you have a control group. And the control group, it has the pretest in the same way. You with me? They have a different intervention or no intervention. But what you normally try to do is to have some other activity that's comparable with mindfulness but different. So it could be, and we use this a bit, sometimes we have people who are just starting out on an exercise program. They might just be starting a course at the gym. But you want to, you want to give them something that has a lot of the same features. You want to say, these people want to improve themselves on some measures. They decided to go to the gym, so that's really interesting. But this is the first, there are a lot of studies like this now. There's another way of studying brain activity, which is quite sophisticated machines that do MRIs. Has anyone had an MRI? You know, you go into a big tunnel 
Nice. Well, you can't move. You can't. It's you'd be clogged. Yeah. yeah. It's a bit claustrophobic. It's a bit claustrophobic. You really need to be mindful. Yeah. <laughs> when you're having an MRI. Well, I, I probably have a slight tendency to be claustrophobic. Not a big one, but a slight one. And I was going to have to have an MRI, I thought. So every night in bed, I'd, I'd visualise it. I visualise going to the MRI and being really relaxed, and I really got myself prepared for it. When I got there, I didn't have to go into the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, give me that tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's a lot of work done now with the MRI images. Uh, and once again, there are brain changes in a positive direction. So it's quite interesting that there are such dramatic brain changes from relatively short-term uh, mindfulness practice. And the practice is so simple. A lot of it's just sitting, being calm, focusing on your breath. Nothing more complicated than that. And when, I, when you read those American authors especially, they just say the beauty of concentrating on your breath is always with you. You don't need any fancy apparatus. Uh, your breathing's always there. Uh, and it, it's just convenient, simple. Anyway, there are a lot of uh, physiological and health changes at, at that level. Mm -hmm. Somewhere up here I've cited, there's a, in this study, they also gave people a flu vaccination and they wanted to measure these antibody <coughs> titties to see what effect mindfulness had. And it produced more antibodies that will, uh, so that's at a different level, quite a, a biochemical level, there are oh. positive effects. So if you saw the eight weeks program, is that, so they do you for just 45 minutes meditation every day? Yeah. Within eight weeks? Yes. They go for uh, a, a, a class once a week. So the class involves a talk about some aspect of meditation and then some, then some meditation. But not a lot of stuff. So I think the class is around a couple of hours a week, just once a week. So they do that. They do one full day retreat. Oh, that for the whole yeah, yeah, only one. Yeah. So if what you're getting at is it's not a huge amount of practice. Mm -hmm. But, but they still observe these outcomes. Someone else had a question? Yeah, so that's right. It, it's not there are other studies on long term uh, meditation practitioners which show really, really quite strong at this. So I'll, I'll put the next slide up there and make it. So in psychological changes, there's improvement in many uh, psychological functions. So if you take that standard study I told you where you measure a pre-test, had the mindfulness training, measure post-test, uh, really quite big effects in depression. Most of my, not most, about half of my students in the last four years have measured depression uh, before and after. And it's, they're really quite big effects. Has anyone here studied psychology? No. You, right. Sometimes you've got to do statistical tests to see if there's a, a significant difference. But sometimes you can just tell by looking that there's a really big difference. And they're the sorts of effects uh, you get in here. So panic disorder, anxiety, ADHD, many, many disorders that are quite significant outcomes. And I put there, in psychology, you can get significant outcomes that they're statistically significant but they're not really psychologically or clinically significant. A lot of these studies do produce clinical significant effects which can last at least up to three years. Mm. They probably last longer, but the studies mostly don't go longer than three years. So I was just going to tell you a little bit about one thesis from a few years ago that I thought was very interesting. Because it brings together a, a number of interesting things, especially if you think about children. But there's been a phase in Western society, probably the 80s, 90s, <coughs> the most, it's interesting to look around the room because I don't think this view has been so prevalent in Chinese communities. Uh, but in Western communities, what became very prominent or prevalent was the most important thing for children to be successful, you know, on a whole range of measures, was to build their self-esteem. Don't be too hard. I'm not advocating to be hard on your children. You shouldn't love your children. But there was a very strong view in schools uh, to build self-esteem because self-esteem will lead to ultimate success. It was a really strong view in psychology and in, child, uh, in education. 
it turns out the research shows that that boosting people's self-esteem without good a good basis, like if you say to your child, that's terrific, you did really well on that test, but you got none out of ten. Isn't a really helpful approach. You're just sort of building self-esteem without building the capability. But it turns out it doesn't self-esteem doesn't predict much about how people will grow and develop. Does that surprise you or is that what you'd expect? No surprise. Yeah. Well it turns out the evidence is very strong. It was all much like psychology went down a blind alley for 10 to 20 years. Because uh, there's a confusion between correlation and causality. But that's, well, I won't go into that now, but there's a difference. What turns out to be really, really powerful in predicting the long-term success of children as they grow up, but success in almost every measure, in terms of career, in terms of social life, in terms of good citizenship, in terms of relationships, is simple willpower, self-discipline or self-regulation. It turns out to be really important in predicting success. So willpower is often it's having the strength to do the hard but good thing and in resisting doing what's often the easy but wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And some of this research started in an interesting way. Some of you may have seen this on TV, but about 30 or 40 years ago, an American psychologist called Michelle had little kids of about four or five in a room with all sorts of toys and sitting at a table, but you'll say to the kid, I'm just going outside for 10 minutes. There are some marshmallows in front of you and you can eat one if you like. But if you don't eat one, when I come back, you can eat two. And what, would, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> These were quite young kids, so I think they were about four. And it turned out there was quite a range of responses. Some kids ate them, some kids didn't. So it was interesting, you can see this, you go to YouTube, you'll see Michelle, you'll see the marshmallow experiment. So then it's interesting to watch, what do the kids who don't eat the marshmallow do? kids. You know, some will look the other way. They just look away, you know, they move themselves away from the temptation. Some will say other things, they'll chant to themselves, don't hit the marshmallow, don't hit the marshmallow. <laughs> <laughs> or things like that. But, so that was a study, it was a really interesting study that some kids can, some kids that can't. But this is a story I've read, I, I think it's probably true, that Michelle's, probably his own child was involved in that study. And they were quite young kids, so his, his child kept going to school with those kids and, and he would hear the stories back. And then he started to realise the kids who didn't eat the marshmallow were doing really well. The kids who did eat them weren't doing anywhere near as well. So that's a really simple starting point for a range of uh, other studies. But it turns out that ability to, is really important in life. Why would I tell you about that today? After you think that's quite interesting little study. It's because of the potential relationship between mindfulness and self-discipline or willpower and how one might help develop the other. So for those of you who do your own mindfulness training, there is quite a lot of self-discipline involved. When you sit down and your head's full, and your mind is full, it takes quite an effort to to find ways to empty the head and just to stay doing it. And so the, I had a student look at this because a lot of uh, thinkers, a lot of people would have thought, well, mindfulness is something, not mindfulness, uh, willpower or self-discipline is something you're born with. You're either born with it or you're not. Well, it turns out you can train willpower like you can train almost any muscle. And there's lots of, and you can demonstrate you can deplete willpower. It works a bit like a muscle. Uh, if you have to, if you train, just in, in uh, no, I'm just trying to think of uh, some example. Uh, a standard technique is if you just, so if you want to train willpower, one thing is to start cleaning your teeth with your left hand. 
-hmm. if you normally do with your right hand. Mm -hmm. it's got, it's, it takes a real act of discipline. But in a fairly short time, you can do that. Instead of slouching, sit up straight. There's a whole range, they're all fairly simple ways, mm. but there are quite good measures to show that you can train your willpower. But there are also good measures to show you can train your mindfulness. Mm. And the interesting thing for me is if you, well, that those two things reciprocate. They're both, in terms of the literature, really good for people. Having good willpower, good self regulation works really effectively. Having really good mindfulness also works effectively. But the fact that they can feed each other, it, to me, is a really good tool for building some important skills, some important life skills. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, a student called Natasha uh, looked at that and got some, the results are more complicated. She could explain the complicated bits, I can explain the but simple bits. But this thing about like willpower and discipline, it's about delayed gratification, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, I'll, I'll put the other way. Delayed gratification is a, is a form of willpower. Yeah, mm -hmm. You're right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's just to hold off that little bit longer yes. to just have what you want, but at that time you need to do that to get there. Yeah. And as simple as that is, in young children growing up, that's a really important skill to develop just delaying gratification. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see, I said before, you can train it and you can, but kids are born, you can tell really early on, some are much better at it than others, mm -hmm. but maybe all can have, can improve at it through training. Mm -hmm. And so can adults. This is just a comment off to the side. In, uh, I stopped teaching psychology on a regular basis about 20 years ago because I went into university administration, or management alone. <laughs> uh, management leadership. Everyone else calls it admi uh, administration. And the biggest change in psychology that occurred since I stopped being uh, active in the psychology department is what's now known about your brain and your brain's responsiveness to training right throughout life now. Is that what they call neuroplasticity? Yes, it is. Yes. Mm. So if someone says you have a plastic brain, it's not necessarily an insult. <laughs> <laughs> It just means you have a brain that's quite sensitive to learning and can respond. And adaptable. And adaptable, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll just put up, this is more for discussion, how does uh, mindfulness help in daily life? I put up, I think I've got the spelling correct, have I, Venerable Chief from the Rami Baharas. Uh, how can uh, mindfulness help in daily life? And there are specific meditations for loving, kindness, compassion, empathy, joy and equanimity. And I just thought it might be an interesting thing to discuss. Empathetic joy, I thought, well they're all really lovely concepts. Empathetic joy is being able to take joy in other people's success. Yes. Some people have a scarcity view of the world. That if you're happy, I'll be less happy. Mm -hmm. Happiness is scarce. Mm -hmm. But you can have an abundance view of the world. That, we're, that if I'm happy, you can also be happy. Mm -hmm. Our happiness can add. And so empathetic joy, being able to empathise and, and enjoy other people's happiness is a really lovely concept that does a lot. Equanimity I was referring to before. Uh, I think equanimity is a really useful concept for living in the world, especially if you're in a stressful situation. Or, uh, if, you're not, if you're not displaying equanimity, if somebody does something that annoys you, you're likely to react really quickly and negatively. Equanimity, you just pause, you have a think, and you give a more considered response. Uh, it's my own experience that, well, that all of these things can be improved in your, through your meditation. That you just seem to have a calmer view of the world that enables you to be kinder to more people. Uh, I've noticed it in, in other people, and, and hopefully me, that, that these two things can really flow through in your conversation. That instead of feeling in your conversation that the main aim of conversation is to keep talking non-stop, is that a really important part of conversation is to listen to the other person. Mm -hmm. And it's, I find if you listen to conversations, I, I travel up from Sydney to Wollongong, Wollongong to Sydney on the train a lot, and you hear lots of conversations. And you can tell the good conversations, because in the good conversations, people are listening. And they go, you might say something to me, so I'll go back to you on your thing, you come back. 
that's a really healthy conversation. Mm -hmm. Some conversations are very different. Monologues. Yeah, monologues. <laughs> yeah, they're not, they're not dialogues, they're just monologues. And they're not all that helpful. They might be helpful to the person who's talking to get something off their chest. <laughs> but but in terms of our society, having good conversation is quite important. Mm -hmm. And my own view is that some of enhancing some of these skills leads to quite a different form of conversation. Mm -hmm. And as trivial as that is, uh, a lot of things in our world are facilitated and enhanced by good conversation. Mm -hmm. But I'm just uh, putting in a thing I want to comment about what do you, through your own mindfulness practice, what do you, where do you see effects in your daily life? I found effects in the workplace, like just being able to stop and think before you react. So you're on the equanimity. Then. Yeah, trying to be. Mm. It's hard high school kids that they try to. <laughs> it's hard. It's probably more important mm. with high school kids. I have seen a recent video clip about all the things that teachers would like to say to their high school kids. <laughs> 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 But it's best not to say. <laughs> some the other kids say it for you. Yeah, some the other kids say it for you. So, any comments on the relationship between meditation and your own experience of some of these other uh, attributes of loving kindness, compassion? Actually, I think for me, in my case, it wasn't really a mindfulness thing because um, I actually started doing some meditation, at least I've had some exposure to meditation since um, university. Yes. So I have actually gotten comments from like workmates or colleagues or clients that usually make a statement. Oh, I'm like, you know, there's like an observation that says, wow, you're really, you're a really calm person. And I used to think, really? Isn't that just normally everyone else? So that seems to be something I usually get. So I think it's something that I, I suppose, relate that to maybe meditation. Like even my peers would say sometimes, you know, say, oh, you know, you've got really good posture at work. I was like, really? Doesn't everyone just sit like that? You know, so <laughs> I think maybe it's that difference. They're, they're really nice comments. And I said before, how do you measure mindfulness and it's their effects? You know, Tick Nat, oh, Tick down in the Vietnamese, <laughs> he said, what do you think is the best way to measure mindfulness in you? I'll just give you as an example, in you. It's from the people around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if, and if the people around you were saying, oh, you're very calm, you always, that's, that's the best sort of feedback that something you're doing is, is having some of these sorts of effects, I would think. I get a similar thing, uh, you know, one of my buddies at work said, you know, you're, so, you're very calm, it's, it's great, but sometimes it's frustrating. Too calm. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it's as though they're, they're talking to me, and it's like they're talking to a like a still pond, and there's nothing happening. <laughs> so, so what was your what was your reaction to that? I was a bit surprised. Yeah. So I think they they need a bit more liveliness to come back. <laughs> so I'd be mindful about being lively or something. You're all right. Yeah. I, I work in mental health hospitals, so you know my clients often actually said, "Oh, well, you know, like being with you is actually so beautiful. You know, you actually so um, I feel calm and I feel happy when I'm actually with you. And just coming to your class, you know, like I just make my day." Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. There's a saying that is used a lot in Christianity or Christian countries. I don't know how much it's used in Buddhism, but people practice what they preach. Mm -hmm. Do you know that? Yes. The reason I mention that, I have quite a bit to do with the Venerables nowadays, and I think they're, they're always like that. And a lot, quite a lot of people at Nen, in Nantian say the Venerables exude that, that sort of calmness, and, and that's practicing what they preach, I, I think. I found that loving kindness communication is helpful to work with difficult people. Uh, it's Sharon Zalberg in her book described when you meditate. Uh, sending loving kindness to first people you love, then to neutral, and then to difficult people. And I found when you do that, you then can easy, like more easily communicate with them at work, for example. Uh, that's my experience as well. Do other people have that experience? I think it does help a lot. It's interesting to say why. I think because when you're doing that, you may not actually be doing anything to them, but you're changing your view yeah, that's right. about interacting with them. Mm -hmm. And it's quite. 
No, no. Yeah. Which change they view, I suppose, because... Oh, no, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, that's right. It can, yeah, secondary effect, it first of all changes your effect, mm-hmm. and so you're more open and a bit more positive, which can then change their reaction. Yeah, it's, it can be quite powerful. Mm-hmm. But the problem I actually have, though, that I, you know, it seems like reacting, you know, like, I actually, it's okay when I'm actually with... I find it very hard, actually, when I'm actually with my mother. And, and my sisters, you know, not to react to them, you know, like, <laughs> why? <laughs> 90 minutes ago. Who would have said that experience? I, I think that's quite common. Yeah. I've never read the literature on that. Probably because I've got such a big family, I don't want to know. <laughs> But sometimes it is harder to be patient with your meet with your with most loved ones. Yeah. Not always, but sometimes it is. It, I don't quite know why. Because you know they will accept you for whoever you are, kind of. Oh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good guess. Yeah. 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 So you think it's okay? And they they don't yeah. mind. And, 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 and sometimes it's correct. <laughs> sometimes it isn't. That's right. Um, just one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, just going into definition, what's the difference between awareness and mindfulness? Uh, in terms of the definition, uh, mindfulness is a, uh, awareness is an element of mindfulness, but it's not everything about it. Because if you're mindful, you're aware, but also you're non-judgmental, uh, you're not self-critical. So there are a few more elements. But mindfulness, uh, awareness is a core part. Yeah. Of what mindfulness. Thank you. Mm. Cool. No, I just get it. Uh, I noticed the program had us going into Q and A about Nantian, so I just keep going. Yeah. Uh, the issue I mentioned earlier was the the debate about whether it's better to learn mindfulness in a Buddhist context or not. Buddhists would certainly say that. Uh, Buddhists would certainly say that. 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 Buddhists would in the context of good ethics and so on and good values, it's going to be more effective. I did come across a study, which I haven't read yet, but recently the Venerable Jay Fung, uh, the, the Abbas and Venerable Jay Wei, and wife and I went to Taiwan, uh, that uh, professor from the University of Hong Kong, he said he's done studies in children, teaching mindfulness with and without the ethical context and found quite big differences. So at Nantian, we teach quite a lot of mindfulness in quite a range of courses. So we have courses called Mindfulness Theory and Practice, Mindfulness for the Professions, Coaching and Counseling, Introduction to Buddhism. Uh, so we teach quite a lot of mindfulness. I might just add uh, It's interesting for me to go and work at Nantian Institute when I was, I was, I was quite happily retired. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying life. And so it, it's interesting for me about why would I do it. Well, there are a number of reasons. One is that I was asked, and the factory always works for me. But the main thing is, I've always been an educator, quite passionate about education. But Nantian is a slightly different education. It's good academic, scholarly education, but there's that personal development, values-based component. And it was really exciting to me to try to be part of an institution which is saying, let's produce graduates who know their discipline, who know their health and social well-being, and all of that stuff, but who take away with them a whole strong set of values, but personal skills that have been developed through practices such as meditation within that value concept. So it's more of a value-based, ethical-based education than most universities give. And when you look around the world today, we need much more education of that sort. So that's uh, that's the challenge that I like at Nantian. And we try to embed that into, into our courses. So, in case you don't know, at uh, Nantian we run master's degrees, graduate diploma, graduate certificate degrees, covering all major schools of Buddhism, uh, uh, not just the Chinese Buddhism, but the temple practices, but all strains, and we're, that's quite good. We do a fair bit of contemporary Buddhism, we ran out a new course recently. It was developed by a professor from the University of Wollongong, who's also a practicing Buddhist, but it was in the environment of sustainability in Buddhism. 
a lot of the Buddhist teachings have quite direct relevance. Most anything, there's a lot more stress in the jobs nowadays. If you see on TV the whole time, post-traumatic stress, uh, patients being more aggressive towards nurses, it's quite a different world. And the, the notion we, or the theme we're working on is who cares for the carers? Mm -hmm. How do you build all of those coping skills in the carers? Mm -hmm. How do you help them build resilience? And from my university experience, which is relatively broad, not many universities put a lot of focus on who cares for the carers. How do you build those skills? How do you build loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity? <laughs> How do you help people become mindful? And that's what we're trying to do here. And increasingly, we'll be moving in that direction, uh, trying to help our students, as they become graduates, to develop, even their mature age students, to develop more resilience and better coping skills so that we can help care for the carer. So that's the angle uh, we're trying to put on our courses. So it's aiming to build resilience, mindfulness training, and rubbing the hearts that I just mentioned, all within an ethical, uh, an ethical basis. And that should be relevant to many. <laughs> That's not missing trying to work out what the word means. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wonder because some of you I know quite a, let me ask who has done some study at Nantian Institute? There must be quite a few. Uh, what we're looking at is what many institutions do is putting some of our courses online. Uh, we don't want to have them fully online. We want to have some online and some face to face. But what we would want to do is to, if you're going to study a, a subject with us, have access to that stuff online, not just as text online, but in an inter interactive way online. Uh, and we, we're doing some interesting work around there. So that when you come to Nantien to do your study, you spend more of your time on the practical elements. Uh, which, at the core of which would be meditation, but there are many other things as well. Uh, and you're not spending so much time just sitting in class, being lectured at, <laughs> like I'm doing today. Uh, you spend more time on interacting, interacting with other students. So I'll give you an example for those who have studied there. I, as you know, studied there with Tamara, Professor Ian Kong, uh, Chris Kang, all terrific courses. But what I've what I think about now is if you, we're in the introduction to mindfulness, you learn some of the mindfulness techniques, then you learn about the five hindrances, you learn about the four Brahmi Viharas. But they're a bit separate. Then you do a little bit of breath meditation over here, you do a bit of body scan meditation. If, if you had more time in a day or two, you could do really interesting things, linking the theories to different forms of meditation. What do you do? What's appropriate meditation if you're really sleepy? What's a really good meditation if you're overactive? What's a really good meditation if you're really doubtful about the effectiveness of meditation? So there are, there are quite good resources around to help you work through that. But I think in our, in our new look at learning, we would have more opportunity in blended mode to work through a whole range of more things, things more practical, but link them in a different way to the theory. So the assignments will become a bit different. You talk, you'll say, well, what's, how do you link these concepts, these Buddhist concepts, to these practices? And how, how effective do you find them? So that's what we're looking at doing there. And it's also to fit in better with a lot of people's lifestyles. I know that some people, and I think maybe Getting five days off work or getting three and two days off work to come and study is quite hard. If you can do some of it, the, the jargon is your place, your pace, your time. Uh, where it fits in, then come for a shorter time, but a more meaningful uh, interaction time. Any comments on that at all? Uh, yeah, that sounds, uh, sounds really good. So, because we just did the environment and sustainability uh, course. It was great. So Michael Adams as a lecturer was, was awesome. But the, by the same token, it's like five days of lectures. I went to some field trips as well. Yeah. So that's pretty intense in terms of getting information in. So if we had that opportunity to to come to grips with the material, and then, like you say, do the practical things, the 
like the experiential things yeah. that would really help to ground the, yeah. ground yeah. what you're learning well, and I'm doing it and doing it together doing those experiences yeah, doing, together yeah. is a big deal I think yeah one of my things that I thought we didn't do enough of when I was studying there was when we were meditating or, and we didn't have enough time to discuss the meditation it was you know you do 10 minutes now then you do a course uh, but going back to another thing you said which I didn't mention studying it the way we do it in Antien five days flat out it's really intense that's what you said but also you don't have all sort of the thinking time uh, for because sometimes just over a semester at university you, your knowledge your thoughts your concepts develop over time and you almost need that processing time for thoughts to percolate through and so on and so having a being able to do that before you come then come for some practice, then do a bit more afterwards online is, is what we're hoping will appeal. There are some other comments that people are going to make about this move to blend. So what is the mix? Is it half-half? We're, we're working on that at the moment. But I think at the moment we're saying we wouldn't move anything fully online. We would keep an experiential component. I think we're mostly thinking that would remain two days. But it, but it doesn't have to be the same for every course. You know, it could vary. Uh, there are some courses that there are some courses over time you'd say these could be fully online, uh, but there aren't many of those. Personally, I would actually say five days is actually good because you know before you go to study, they actually will send you. I think about a week, isn't it? Um, before they actually will send you the reading materials anyway, and then you actually read it. Yeah. And and you know especially you know with the um, mindfulness practice and and um, theory, you need to actually to have five days to actually to practice and to actually to go and group and and you know talk and discuss with with your lectures and also with the. Um, um, sustainability environments and Buddhism, we also need five days at least. You know that five day I five personally is actually is needed because you know you go on um, field trips and and you discuss and you know you, you cannot do it in two days. I don't think. Yeah, what we're going to find is a complete range of responses. Yeah. And and in the first instance, we're not going to go either or. I think in the first instance we'll be able to offer, I think, so mindfulness theory and practice in the traditional mode and in blended mode mm -hmm. to see how it goes. If you look at almost any university in the country now about how they're doing their courses, more and more uh, are, are including blended learning. Mm -hmm. At the University of Southern Queensland, if you get to any regional uh, university in Australia, they don't have big populations in their cities. Toowoomba is the biggest inland city in Australia, but it only has about 100,000 people. It's not enough for a full university. The only way you can get a full university is to go online. So at University of Southern Queensland, three quarters of their students are online students. So that says quite a bit about the demand, I think. Uh, if you go to any university now, University of Sydney, anyone here go to the University of Sydney? Nearly all universities are moving more of their materials online, even if they have lectures. And when I walk into the psychology department, we'll every time the lecturers are complaining, no one comes to my lectures anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's all online. Yeah. And then I, because I'm not doing it every day, I just say, well, what are you doing to make them want to come? Because if it's online, they're not going to come just to get it read out. Mm -hmm. You've got to have different ways of engaging and so on. Anyway, it's an ongoing trial for us and uh, we'll and we, we're doing it to give more students an opportunity to study with us. But also, NTI needs more students, and so it's a pragmatic issue for us. You giving me a signal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are very mindful, yes. <laughs> that I've pretty well done. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got to just open up for, for the form for any questions. So, any questions about NTI or any questions about mindfulness? Yes, um, MTI they have few uh, curriculum, uh, but they have also uh, just a certificate award, uh, graduate, uh, for graduate and also master degree for the same subjects. So how to work out? So they will have the same, same they deliver the class at the same time or they will differ, there will be difference and their feedback assignment will be in the different levels. 
for, for those things, for graduate certificate, graduate diploma or masters, they're all at the same level. Yeah. You just do more of them for a masters. Yeah. You, you do four for a graduate certificate, uh, eight for a graduate diploma, and then uh, must be twelve, uh, sixteen. Is it? Twelve. No, I think it's twelve for a. Uh, so, but they're all the same level, okay. and assignments are the same. But not everybody. Some people, and I think we've got examples today. Some people who, uh, for their own reasons, do the courses but don't do the assessment. Mm -hmm. They just choose. They're doing it for interest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any courses deliver in the city, like this campus? Yes, we do. We do deliver here, um, and we're quite willing to, to, to deliver here, as long as we get enough students. Uh, but we did a course here not very long. I think we did that... Uh, uh, coaching? Yeah, coaching, coaching and counselling, I think, was the last one we ran up here. Right. But if there's enough demand, we, we, we do run courses here. Um, has that course been advertised anywhere? Oh, it would have been advertised, yes. Okay, maybe I'll overlook. Uh, uh, we're, we're redoing our marketing. We, we don't think we've had really effective marketing, but that's we're in the process of changing that now. Cool, I'm trying to pick everyone's brains at lunchtime about okay. <laughs> how so we should do it. Okay. Yeah. Tom, have a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, Buddha talked about greed, anger and ignorance. And so it's about the ignoring part, and it seems from my understanding about our psychology is that we do have a good ability as humans to ignore things. Uh, so that can be like things